the first place uh, that I steer them and, and really that they have questions themselves is how do I get started, uh, which can be a question that really anyone will have uh, because they uh, have a, a hankering to do something and yet the ocean is too big. You cannot boil uh, the entirety of it. So we start off uh, with uh, setting out what their objectives are. So uh, geographically, uh, are you looking for an investment? You found the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures, and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. We are here today talking with super smart people. The Ivy League has outnumbered you today, Rory. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. We're, I'll try to keep up with you. Yeah, well, there's two of us on this one. I mean, like we've done two attorneys before, and then I feel outnumbered. But this time, you know, we had to bring in the reinforcements, and Pam Hill is here. She is the CEO of a multi million dollar real estate company and she is in charge of a website and a brand my smart cousin she has worked fortune 500 executive and she is harvard and dartmouth educated love that that's awesome pam welcome first we should say welcome to the podcast Thank you. Thank you so very much. Really excited to be a part of your podcast, uh, Jason and Rory, and, uh, and just answering all the deep questions that I know your guests have. So this is fantastic. Yeah. I had to just look for any kind of thing I had from Brown. And I have this, which is, it's my old mailbox from oh. actually, yeah, they gave us the opportunity to buy them when they were knocking down the old mail room. And I jumped at my old box. So my old box was 5455 five, and it was available. So I got it. And it's actually... It's like a piggy bank now. Yes. Isn't it funny how you remember these things? Uh, I went to Dartmouth a couple of weeks ago for a reunion there. And I, I just as you said, they called them Hinman boxes there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I looked for my old Hinman box, which, of course, is already in use by another student. But it is a nice yeah. piece of nostalgia. So Dartmouth for undergrad and then Harvard for grad school? Is that what you That's did? right. So uh, in between the two of them, I went to Johns Hopkins' program. It was just brand new, brand spanking new that they created uh, with Nanjing University. So at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. they require you to take a language to graduate. Uh, so my language was Chinese. So I took that my junior and senior year, uh, went to China junior summer. Uh, loved uh, the language so much uh, that I deferred Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School of Government, uh, for a year in order to go on the Johns Hopkins Nanjing program. So all the classes were in Chinese, exams, papers, studying everything from uh, Leninism to communism to the Chinese economy to Chinese U.S. foreign trade. And I am still in touch with my roommate. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, she and I would speak in Chinese. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we'd speak in English. And uh, Sunday would just be uh, Chinglish, I guess. <laughs> I don't think we've had any Chinese speakers on yet that we know of, right? Well, no, we certainly haven't filmed uh, the podcast in Chinese. No, that must help you in your business endeavors, Pam. I mean, like you could basically help give financial advice in multiple languages. Yeah, absolutely. And I have done that. So uh, with my roommate, uh, she and I, uh, we still speak in Chinese. Um, we talk with other potential investors uh, who are Chinese. And so it does help to to give a sense of engagement, I'd say, with the people that we're talking mm -hmm. with. And then likewise, Spanish. Uh, my Spanish was initially family Spanish. Um, I met my first husband actually in China, and he's from a country called Equatorial Guinea, which speaks Spanish. I didn't know Spanish. He didn't know English. So we spoke in Chinese our first two years. I ended up learning Spanish uh, through his family, as well as my first uh, corporate job, where I was the uh, director of finance for all our projects in Latin America. So that meant getting to know Spanish pretty intensively. Wow. That's quite a pedigree right there with all those languages. And, you know, we'll bring this back to the real estate world as well. But, you know, just understanding your background of finance and financial education and working with clients, working with Fortune 500 companies, working as somebody, an executive within a company, but also doing your own investing on the side, it shows that you have an awful lot of experience and probably a lot of things to say about where the economy is today and ways to, you know, find financial independence, especially from the real estate side. I know you have discussed 
being able to purchase real estate for the price of a car? You what heard right. That's exactly yeah. right. A whole house, uh, not just the down payment, but the whole house for the price of a car. Let's get into that in just a second. I also want to highlight one other thing on your website where you say that one of your goals is to help black and brown folks and especially women understanding their money, increasing accountability and building generational wealth. I think that's amazingly important. And you know, just before we hit record, I, I said that sometimes people need to see and hear people who look like themselves to you know be able to take action. And you know, there's all different types of pundits out there and people that give experience, but um, you know, it's very important. You know, we have listeners of all types, and you know, sometimes if you need to see someone that looks like yourself to motivate yourself, um, you know, you're giving a voice to people that you know really need to help build generational wealth. Because I mean, there've been studies out there that I'm sure you've read that show you know there's a huge wealth gap between white and black and brown people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I agree with you completely that it, it can be very motivating, certainly, uh, to see someone who looks like you. The voice can resonate just a bit more when you see that and know that it's within the realm of the possible. And I firmly believe uh, that all boats rise together. And, and since these United States are, are comprised of so very many vessels, as it were, from all over, uh, when one does better, we all do better. I almost see it as a patriotic duty, uh, yeah. as it were, to make sure that all of the planks within the country are doing well. Rory and I have talked about this before. In speaking with yourself, other investors, people in the real estate world, you know, obviously there is local competition. You know, people are competing over listings, they're competing over properties. But for knowledge, you know, Rory, we've talked about it a lot. Everyone just shares knowledge with each other because you know you don't have to win. You you don't have to lose for me to win, right? You know, Rory, you've talked to lots of people at, you know, you were at a meetup last night, right? I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't even ask you how it went. Our industry, like a lot of industries, you're, it's about building the relationships. And it's, you know, there's competition, of course, out there, but it's about building relationships and having, you know, ditching that whole zero sum mentality because it's not about winning at somebody else's expense, um, at least not in this industry. I would agree completely. Zero sum is far too narrow and uh, and there's just so much more to be gained when we all collaborate and help to figure out how to build more rather than to uh, compete for what looks like only a handful of crumbs. And I think, as you said, back to the notion of local, that local does provide a huge advantage for folks who feel like uh, they can't compete against you know, you name a big boy type thing uh, as far as an investor uh, or a real estate company. Uh, the advantage of being local is that you see opportunities that others might miss. So, so one that comes to mind for me is a property that I bought, say four units, so four apartment units, and then on the first floor is a bar. So it's a mixed use property. Um, I bought it a few years ago. The bar was not uh, operating. It didn't have a liquor license. It was something that had been shut down long ago, but it had the potential to come back. At any rate, this property had been listed, as it were, through the aid of a simple eight and a half by 11 sheet piece of paper that said for sale with a name and phone number on it. And uh, it was not on any MLS site. Uh, so I was just diligent about calling and uh, finally was able to get in touch with the person who was selling it and able to buy it. And that property was, I believe, about $27,000. So that's the example of where when you are local, you are able to uh, almost ant style uh, kind of get to see your neighborhood in a granular way that even Google Earth doesn't allow you to fully appreciate. If you don't mind, I ask, where are your investments? Absolutely. Uh, they sound uh, big in terms of three states, right? Anytime you say three states, it, it feels like it's beginning to creep up on a regionalism uh, that you have captive. But because of the location, uh, so I am uh, in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. in Marcus Hook. And uh, so that just happens to be at the crossroads of Wilmington, Delaware, which is a handful of miles away, and also at the crossroads of Southeast New Jersey. In five minutes, 10 minutes, you're over a bridge and into uh, Southeast Jersey. So thus, I'm in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the area very well. I used to live in Mercer County, New Jersey. So in okay. about, about a, an hour away from Philadelphia. And I used to drive down to DC a lot in a past life for a previous job. And, you know, the northern tip of Delaware. Actually, I don't think you have to drive to DC and hit Delaware, do you? No, you, dr you no. drive over. No, you don't have no. to. Yeah. But, but I have driven through before. It's, you know, it's a very quick drive in the northern part of Delaware when you do go that route. But yeah, all of those sound like they're within, what, a one or two hour 
Exactly. Within a one hour distance, within about 30 miles for the most part, except for one property that's in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which is probably more like uh, 45 miles or so away. We've heard from a lot of people who invest in faraway markets, you know, maybe Rust Belt cities or the Sun Belt. They're investing in Arizona, Texas, Florida, what have you. Why did you decide to have your investments be a little more local to where you are? Right. So I really fell into it. Um, So both fell into the localism of it, as well as into real estate, full stop. So when I was working an electric utility uh, in a high flying, uh, high pressure job, my husband at the time we were dating and he did not own a house uh, in the U.S. He owned one outside of the U.S., but not in the U.S. He was in an apartment. So he was looking. So it happened that the real estate agent that we got with showed us some homes in Wilmington, Delaware. They were all row houses. This would have been around the time of the Great Recession, maybe a a couple of years after it. And the houses uh, were in the $20,000 neighborhood. And I was absolutely stupefied to see that. And I'd say we were fortunate to have a real estate agent who started with uh, the telescope, as it were, kind of the other way around. So we're used to looking through a telescope where you start off as far out, the telescope looks as far out as your bank says you can look. Uh, So if you're qualified for 200,000, well then guess what? That's the price of houses that you're gonna look at, probably 199,000 up to 240, because your realtor will say, oh, they'll negotiate down and moreover, they'll look to push you just a little higher. He turned it the opposite way around and said, we're going to look at houses that are very close in and go up from there. And so that house was $26,000 maybe, and now we rent it out. So that's what led me to fall into real estate is seeing the tremendous value. Then once I saw that house in Wilmington, I continued to look in Wilmington. I looked in Baltimore, but I felt that was a little too far when there was so much opportunity right in Wilmington uh, and then moved out into Southeast Jersey as well as uh, Southeast PA. So in the city of Chester uh, and in the city of Coatesville, PA. And uh, really haven't looked back. I, I think that when you mentioned the Rust Belt, absolutely, there is still plenty that's available there. And property management firms, as long as you pick a capable one, is a great way to go in order to shoehorn your way into that geography. How many properties do you manage? So I manage uh, all for myself. So it's 25 properties comprising 31 units. So I have not taken on anyone else's property uh, thus far, although I am certainly exploring that, looking at property management as an actual business. So outside of the real estate investment and the coaching, I also am a general contractor. And I encourage folks who are involved in real estate to look at opportunities that are almost parallel opportunities that they can consider. So in the same way that when they first begin a real estate investment, they will look to an outside property manager, as I did. I certainly didn't start off by saying, I'm going to do this myself. I paid someone, learned from them. I considered that tuition. And then that tuition after uh, three or four properties uh, worth, uh, I felt that I had learned enough to go ahead and begin to give it a go myself. And then the same thing, of course, with the renovations. The tuition is the general contractor that you pay or the handyman that you pay. And then after a time, you know enough such that you put together your own two or three man crew and begin to manage it yourself. I love that mentality too, because when you're hiring out these external people to work, you're not just abdicating responsibility for your own investments and your own, you know, your own future with it. You're actually taking the initiative to, to learn from them, to watch what they're doing and to, to grow yourself so that at a certain point you can decide whether you want to keep hiring a third party to do it, or you're educated enough to actually take on those responsibilities directly yourself. I love that mentality. And I love that that's how you um, gain that knowledge. And I agree with you completely, Rory, for folks who who think to themselves, oh, darn, I hate that I have all these expenses. I think that if they turn it around and think of it as I am investing, I am paying someone, thus they are my teacher. I am the student. So let me be a good student and get my money's worth so that I can then make the decision on whether I want to walk in their shoes, I can. So something I have my clients do is when they hire a property inspection person before they make a decision on if they're going to buy a house, show up 15 minutes ahead of when the inspector shows up, walk all around, walk inside, have your notebook, 
have your pen, jot down everything. If he looks up, if the inspector looks up at the ceiling, Mm -hmm. you look up too. Hey, what are you looking at? What do you see there? Oh, gee, I didn't see that stain. I wonder what could have caused that. Oh, wait, you're going on the roof. Do you mind taking pictures? I've never seen a roof before or a video. And that way you are taught. And for sure, when the inspector sends you the report, what you don't do, well, I guess it's just going to sit on email. What you do, Mm -hmm. let's open it up, call and have them walk you through it. I have two things that I just want to draw attention to. First, they don't not teach me this stuff at Brown. They didn't teach you this stuff at Harvard. <laughs> no, they Harvard, did not. Right? No. no, they didn't. I mean, like, you know, there's a different level of you know classic education that the schools that I love Brown, right? I'm sure hopefully you liked Dark. Yes, and Harvard, yes, I but, did. But this just feels so practical now, at least in my life and in your life now. And it was not part of our college education. So I admire you for continuing to learn And maybe that's just in your nature, since you know multiple languages and have multiple degrees, that you just kind of, now you're learning this new thing and this is your education. It also sounds like you did all this after like your career, right? Like you worked for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize that to people who are listening, that you're never too young or too old to start. Young people are like, well, I don't have the money to do this, but some folks, you know, roll their sleeves up and find a way. The other side of the coin is people that feel like they're they're past their prime to be able to start. And, you know, I'm in my 40s and I don't feel like I'm too late to start. You know, I feel like I started on this real estate side in my early 40s and I'm continuing to learn as well. You know, so it's great that this is almost like a second career for you. Right. And this is like that's you know, exactly right. Full time now. I couldn't agree more that you're never too old or too young on the too young side. So I am mentor to a program that a bank started. These kinds of programs probably exist all over the U.S. This particular one just happens to be called Jumpstart, you know, add the name of the city. But uh, it's a mentorship program for young developers, Uh, young, not meaning age wise, but experience wise. And our youngest age wise is a college student. And that 20 year old has managed to buy their first house and flip it. Uh, And then likewise, turning it around uh, for those who say, well, gee, I'm set in my ways. Uh, I don't have a lot to risk. And yet I still have got an itch for this thing called real estate investment. You can start tiny. You can start with your home sweet home. These days through short-term rentals, even things like swimming pools, there are websites that have people allow people to rent out by the hour their above ground or below ground swimming pool storage. There are folks who do not want to put their items in storage, but they will put them in your house. So there's a lot of ways that someone can get involved. Yeah, I've heard about those. I don't have a swimming pool. I I was curious uh, if people really booked them, but there's lots of different ways to to make money. I mean, like there's sites for visiting nurses, for example. You know, there's sites for you know a shared economy in the year 2022, which is when we're recording this, is very common for a generation of people that are realizing that they don't have to own everything. They could just kind of rent it from others. And then that provides an opportunity for somebody to make some money if they're the one that does own the asset. Absolutely. Tell us about the types of people who you're mentoring, especially on, you know, I mentioned earlier on your website that, you know, you have a a specific focus on black and brown people and women. Mm -hmm. What are the things that they're asking you? What, how are you coaching them and what direction are you steering them? Sure, absolutely. So the first place uh, that I steer them and and really that they have questions themselves is, how do I get started? Uh, Which can be a question that really anyone will have because they have a a hankering to do something and yet the ocean is too big. You cannot boil uh, the entirety of it. So we start off uh, with uh, setting out what their objectives are. So geographically, are you looking for an investment that is one that you will live in? In other words, a two-family, three-family, four-family investment, or one that's, as you mentioned, the Rust Belt, and here I am in the Northeast, I want nothing to do with it. Uh, What is the amount of money uh, that you're looking at? And the financing strategy itself, and then really digging into that, there's an awful lot of free money that's out there for folks who are looking to be, to establish the house as their residence. Uh, So looking at that. And then lastly, talking through what their overall objectives are over the next five years so that they can begin to connect to the passion within them, the dream, so that it doesn't feel like something that's just pure homework for them to have to plod through. Um, And I always uh, make it personal uh, in 
telling them about my own story. So in my case, uh, my parents, they bought uh, their first house and their only house when I was a child. Uh, My mom still lives there. And I had the good fortune to see neighbors on both sides, all African-American families who had left their house to their children. Uh, But often what happens, to your point about real estate and business not being a part of the dinner table conversation, is that these homes were lost. Yes, finances were talked about around the dinner table. In my case, it was usually we have bills to pay, but certainly not, hey, there's this thing called Wall Street. So as a result of folks losing their homes through predatory or other, just otherwise, not knowing to prioritize property taxes and such, I internalized this mission that when Black and brown folks and women talk about generational wealth, the very first step is to keep the wealth that you already had, the wealth that was left to you if you were fortunate enough to have a parent or grandparent who passed something down, or if you are in those shoes yourself with a house, how do we make sure that that gets held on to? And then from there to build, but to have that mindset. So it's not just, well, let me just go find myself a good government job. Mm -hmm. Good government jobs are nice, but there can be more to it. So let's talk a little bit about buying a house for the price of a car. In this day and age, I mean, interest rates are just rising, like we're above the sixes now. We're expecting the Fed to, you know, add what another three quarters of a basis point or something at the next meeting. Again, how do you do that? Absolutely. You are right. The Fed is on a mission to try to cool down the economy. And and we certainly all respect and understand that. So again, back to the personal. So how did I do it? So I started off by looking through that other end of the telescope. So uh, just as an example, um, for anybody who's listening, like, okay, Pam, really and truly just show me how you do this stuff. Go on to whatever your favorite uh, website is, your favorite MLS website. So if it's Zillow or Redfin or what have you, and then search, put in parameters that first are house related, right? So get rid of the land, uh, get rid of the uh, manufactured housing, if that's a component of it, get rid of the apartments and just simply look for houses and multifamily houses. Uh, Once you've done that, put in, let's say, two bedrooms, since that's probably the smallest you'll want to look at. Uh, Then next, put in a minimum and a maximum. The default otherwise is zero. And of course, nothing sells for zero. So put in, let's say, a minimum of 10,000 and put in a maximum of, let's say, $60,000. And you are able on most of these sites to search by state. So you don't have to feel limited to, well, gee, I don't see anything here in Uh, I don't know, in Jackson, Mississippi, I guess I better go find another city. No, you can put it in the entire state of Mississippi or Indiana or Ohio or what have you. Once you have done that, you are then going to search for lowest to highest price. And when you do that, say for a handful of states, so let me get those out of the way. Forget about it, California, close your ears, start looking in the Midwest. This is not for you. Same thing, Alaska, goodbye. Hawaii, you're lovely, but you're impossible as far as the price of a house. Uh, So there are a few states that are a no, but there are states that are an absolute yes that you wouldn't even think could be New York State. We all think New York City, impossible. Well, that's not the case with upstate New York. You will find houses and multifamily houses uh, that are in the 30 40, 50, up to $60,000 neighborhood. You will find them in Ohio. You will find them in the state of Pennsylvania, not just here uh, in the part of Pennsylvania I am in uh, near Philly, but going west, Erie, think Scranton, those parts of Pennsylvania towards Pittsburgh, uh, for sure the state of Wisconsin, the state of Michigan. So on any given day, just only through the MLS platform, you are going to see hundreds of houses that are the price of a car. Your next criteria, once you've done that, is then to begin to open up some of these links for those that have, I'd say at least five pictures. Something that's got one picture is probably got some problems uh, beyond your ability as a first-time investor to think about. And when you look, see, does the house have the basic foundation that you're looking for? All four walls, a roof, probably just some drywall that needs to be patched, some new floors, painting the kitchen cabinets, possibly replacing the furnace, that sort of thing. In other words, a $15,000 to $20,000 price tag on renovation. That's it. 
Then you're talking about being what, 70, 80,000 into a house that- That's exactly right. So you're 70, 80 in. So let's say that you get the house, just as you said, for 50, got 20 on it. So now you're at 70. So now what can I rent a house like that for? Well, as you mentioned, prices are going up. So if prices are going up for the price of a house, prices are going out for the price of rent. So rent- Even in a low income neighborhood, and I have to say for the investors out there who think, wait, low income, who in the world's going to want to rent there? Uh, Everybody. The people who are living in these neighborhoods are already living in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So what they are looking for then are the two other things that they can control, which is, do I have a good landlord and do I have a good house? So if you can go ahead and check those two boxes, you've checked two out of three. And on the neighborhood, if you're a good landlord, you can get to know the chief of police and so on to try to improve things around the margin. That's uh, first around, gee, should I even look at that kind of neighborhood? Now, what kind of rent am I going to see in that kind of neighborhood? You can do two things. First thing you can do is just type in the zip code and see zip code plus house for rent. And you will see what the rents are. I would say generally the rent is going to be for a three bedroom, one bath, somewhere in the $1,400 or so neighborhood. So that's going to put us at about, do the math, I don't know, what is that, about $17,000, $18,000 a year gross by five years, six years or so. And you're at a break even, not of course, including the property taxes, the insurance and the financing. With financing, uh, you can break even in this many 10 fingers, 10 years or less, just like the price of a car and its financing horizon. Yeah. Rory, how many searches have you done in that price range? None recently, but I'm definitely putting that in my um, to-do list for right after we wrap up here. That, that kind of rhymes a little bit with other advice that we've heard on bigger pockets and elsewhere saying that, you know, no matter where you live in the country, within a two hour drive, you can find a market that might work a little bit better for you. Because I know people who live, you know, where we live here in Boston, Bay Area, California, other parts of the country, it just seems so prohibitively expensive to get your foot in the door. But if you expand your horizons just a little bit, you can still keep it local to you. You can keep it in a state that you know, and like maybe not Alaska, Hawaii, um, most of California, but we can do that search here and we'll have to hop in the car, we'll have to you know expand beyond our immediate neighborhood, but you can find opportunities anywhere. Absolutely. You have to run the numbers a little differently with the higher interest rates today. Mm-hmm. But you know, if you could find a property to work at the interest rates today, then it definitely will work. You know, who knows where things are going down the line? You know, I don't know when we'll have a refinancing opportunity again. But you know, if you're looking at property Absolutely. at the price of a car, you know, that mortgage payment won't be that big. You know, maybe some mm-hmm. people could actually pay cash for it. If Absolutely. And you have to keep in mind too, yes, the interest rate is higher, but the rent is higher. And whereas interest rates will come down uh, in their cyclicality, it's it's rare that rents, rents themselves really come down. And something that is a particular value with a house for the price of a car versus, let's say, versus a flip, your typical flip where it's going to be uh, six figures, maybe 150, and it's it's the $150,000 house in the $300,000 neighborhood. And so there's that immediate value that you can obtain, mm-hmm. which is absolutely a good value. With a house for the price of a car, meaning 50s or so, that is not a flip opportunity, not in the near term. If you're looking at flips, don't be in this market. You need to be in this market for two things. One is the annuity, as it were. In other words, the rent, the rental income. Second is the lottery ticket value of the property. So yes, the property will appreciate. Of course it will. Um, I have a house that I bought, um, I think it was in 2018, uh, that I bought for 15500 And now its value is something like 150000 But that is really not a lottery ticket value. Lottery ticket value is when you have, let's say, a Brooklyn, New York happen. So 20 years ago, Brooklyn, New York, um, the, the those prices were probably in the in neighborhoods that would have been considered unsafe neighborhoods. Uh, the price would have been maybe in the forty to fifty thousand dollar neighborhood. Uh, now you have to add one zero, two zeros. Those are million dollar homes, every one of them. Uh, so that's a lottery ticket. The lottery ticket can happen because of gentrification, 
because of some set of economic development factors that coalesce. So that's what you wait for. So here's a lottery ticket. I don't know if it will occur, but one that I can see having a possibility of occurring. Uh, The city of Wilmington, Delaware. Why Wilmington? Because President Joe Biden, a longtime senator of Delaware and and certainly uh, with Wilmington roots, will, I would imagine, uh, construct his presidential library when that time comes in the great city of Wilmington. And much like how parts of Chicago near the Obama library are seeing a material increase in price, I would expect the same with Wilmington. So those are the kinds of micro pockets uh, where this lottery ticket might materialize and that you can target. And it's being aware of that and understanding where things might be in that specific neighborhood in five or 10 years you know, I think that Rory's office is based in South Boston, where we've lived. And, you know, that I think is a lottery ticket neighborhood, at least it was 20 years ago when I first bought in there in 2003. And then everything just went bonkers since then, you know, but a lottery ticket neighborhood, it's I don't think it is anymore, because it's already had its lottery ticket, you know, it's now stable and desirable. Uh, but yeah, it's it's finding those pockets that might be near public transit, might be near a new attraction, that if you could have the foresight a few years down the line as to what projects are coming in there and get in right now, you know, you might see that explosive 5X, 6X, even higher growth on some of your properties if they're low enough. I was going to ask before we get to our final questions, my smart cousin, tell me about how that came about. Yeah, how that came to be. Absolutely. So I've always been that cousin at our family reunions who follows up with folks uh, when it comes to their personal finances with with anything uh, that's got money attached to it. So if they told me at last year's family reunion, you know, I'm thinking about finally getting started in my retirement fund that my uh, job is offering me, or I'm tired of renting. I wonder how I can get into some kind of little piece of a house. That cousin that really does follow up with them uh, and, and thus the kind of moniker within the family. Oh, here come my smart cousin, Pam, come on over here. I got a question for you. And so as a result, I treat the family, friends, and and now clients all as as part of that big, my smart cousin family. And I suppose a name like that, I'm also looking to connote that these really are just kitchen table topics. Um, If you can't explain... um, personal finance uh, or, or even corporate finance or just about any topic, if you can't explain it like you're talking to a five-year-old in just very plain, basic English words, uh, not high jargon words, then you probably need to go back and study a little more because you yourself might be lost on certain concepts. And that's why you aren't able to articulate it. So that's why I used my smart cousin because the idea is we're just going to talk plain. We're going to talk simple. I'm going to refer to your check register to help you make the jump between that and how your business finances should look. That's brilliant. I love that. And now you're imparting that wisdom on clients and friends and us. You're now our smart cousin as well. You're yes, you're part of the family. <laughs> you're, you're probably trying to get yeah. get your clients to be the smart cousin <laughs> also. And Family dues are uh, are due uh, at the end of the month. You're, okay. you're welcome to come to our reunion in August. <laughs> well, that w- but you're the smart cousin, though. I won't be the smart cousin at that reunion, though. We've got many a smart cousin, so uh, so you will be for your niche. <laughs> What's important in that lesson is sometimes like being smart doesn't mean talking above people and getting them more confused. Just to the opposite. Just sound smart to them. It is. You're right. It's the opposite. It is dumbing it down, talking to them like they're a fifth grader, like not condescending, but in a way that they're going to understand it. Mm -hmm. And if you could explain it that way, then that is the true sign of brilliance. Because you can explain it to someone like that. Conversation Uh, is for the benefit of others, not you. Yeah, it certainly is. Well, Rory, why don't we get to the final couple of questions that we ask all of our guests? I'd love to hear Pam's responses to some of these. Now, do you want to do them? You stumbled on them early on when we were talking about it, but I think you have it down, right? <laughs> I've started over these in the past, so we'll see how I do here. So, you know, our first final question is if you had to give a presentation for 30 minutes on any topic whatsoever with zero preparation, what topic would that be? How to buy a house for the price of a car. And it would be that because that is meaningful to everyone. When I was uh, at a college reunion three weeks ago, I talked to college students about how to do that. And I talked to a lump. Uh, So this is something the white picket fence that is still the American dream, despite the many uh, challenges that so many families have, should be in reach of every American. 
my personal thought. And thus, we can start with one component of getting everyone that by buying a house for the price of a car. Love it. That's your TED Talk. You know, another question we like to ask of everybody is, what's something that happened early in your life that's impacted how you live and how you do business today? Absolutely. I was young. I started off probably like every kid, you know, selling sunflower seeds and and selling candy and and so on. But as I got older, I had a chance to watch what real life uh, looked like. And and I'm from a small family, me, my mom, and myself. So I could only imagine what it looked like for friends and family. But life could be very difficult. My dad was a taxi driver. My mom was working uh, for an airline that no longer exists, uh, but in baggage claim. And so I got a chance to see that without careful financial planning, you could very much find yourself at the crosshairs and the whims a bit of the economy. So uh, the lesson that I took from that is that you cannot only rely on work. Yes, work is important, but you have to have multiple stakes in the ground, multiple streams of income is how some have translated into that into. So that's the big takeaway that I took is that you need to make sure that you are the captain of that ship as much as you can. Great advice. And on something light here, what's something that you're watching or listening to these days? So I'm always a fan of uh, some of the older uh, shows that are out there. So with the passing um, months ago of the great Betty White, uh, I Sometimes I I just love to indulge with things like the Golden Girls. um, That never gets old. Uh, And it's funny because when you watch shows that are older, you can see a slice of America and how we thought about things years ago. And when I want to delve into the serious, Marketplace is probably among my favorite news podcasts to listen to because they always have a snapshot of what's happening in the here and now. So I like to... uh, I suppose, be a full person, as it were, uh, all facets. In other words, not just only work Pam, only serious Pam, but also play Pam. I think we all should uh, indulge uh, in the full spectrum of ourselves and see our clients that same way. We love Marketplace. We listen to that a lot as well. And the Golden Girls, I am also old enough to remember that when it was a first run show. Yes. Uh, back in the classic 80s sitcoms. And yes. Every so often I'll just find my way to the Golden Girls. And, you know, it's, it's still funny today. Very witty humor. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Pam, tell everybody where they could find you if they want to reach out to you and learn more from you and uh, become, become one of your students. Absolutely. Become, become a smart cousin themselves. <laughs> become part of the My Smart Cousin family. So um, I urge them to head on over to mysmartcousin.com. So that's M-Y-S-M-A-R-T-C-O-U-S-I-N.com. Of course, they can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. The handle is at My Smart Cousin, same with Facebook. And then when you are on the My Smart Cousin website, First of all, there's all kinds of free content that's there. So I have an ebook that's free that's there. I have a number of blogs um, that I've written that are there, as well as uh, video snippets, vignettes that you're able to watch. And then certainly if you say, no, that's a nice taste, but let's face it, Pam, I actually want someone to come hold me by the hand or guess what? Five years from now, I'll still be just sitting here looking. All right. In that case, then let's get going. Uh, Let's do it through either three-hour classes that I do online or through one-on-one coaching. Uh, Because as the old saying goes, uh, if you want to change what you have from this world, then you've got to change how you exhibit yourself in this world. It's all about taking that action. Take the action. Yeah. Rory, where can people find you? Uh, People can find me at my brokerage, Next Home Title Town, nexthometitletown.com, or my law practice, Urban Village Legal, urbanvillagelegal.com. I love that handle, Urban Village. I like yeah. that very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. We came up with that, what, a long time ago, eight years ago? We came out about eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. We're looking yeah. for something to depersonalize the law office because it's not about me. And a lot of attorneys tend to name their practices um, after themselves, but it wasn't about me. <laughs> me, myself, and I. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, so I wanted to you know, name it for my community in a way that spoke to what I did. Um, so we, after, after a bit of brainstorming, Urban Village Legal is uh, what I've had for, for about a decade now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels welcoming, feels engaging. 
No, oh, that's nice to thank, hear. Thank you for listening also to this podcast. And Pam, thank you for being on the podcast. Like we really appreciate your insights and uh, your perspective. It's it's always nice to hear from uh, folks from the East Coast. Uh, we've had a lot of people on the West Coast uh, on the podcast as well. And yeah, I can't wait to go do some MLS searches uh, between ten and sixty thousand dollars in Massachusetts. I just want to see what comes up, you know. So, mm-hmm. and everyone, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, go uh, reach out to Pam on her website, uh, mysmartcousin.com, or on social media. And you can give us a review also on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this. Drop us a comment. We will watch and listen to all those comments. You don't watch comments. Well, I guess if people, you can send us a video <laughs> comment. That's fine too. And on behalf of Rory and Pam, I'm Jason Muth. And I really appreciate your listening to the Real Estate Law Podcast. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You found the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures. Law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. 